Tere õhtust! Me jätkame oma loengusarja Maailmi rahva Ja täna on meil siis külas Pinjin Wu Kes on pärit Hiinast Aga on doktorant ja elab tegelikult Eestis Õpib ta Tallinna ülikoolis Antropoloogi osakonnas Kirjutab oma tööd Ja sellest, millest ta siis kirjutab Ta hakkabki täna rääkima, kuidas ta Paltma ja ehitust praktiseeris ja õppis Eestis So now a little introduction in in English. So we continue with our series of lecture titled World and Nations. And uh, today, Pinjin Wu is uh, going to talk of um, his experiences, um, how uh, he was practicing uh, the log building practice in in, uh, in rural Estonia with the master of uh, carpenter. And so we, this uh, topic, you are going to write your PhD, your thesis also on this topic. So yeah. we are like a big ear to ear what kind of experiences Thank you, Thank you, you had. So please, the stage is yours. Okay, guys. I'm bad with introductions, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, hopefully something about me will come up uh, during the presentation. Uh, God, you already said, my name is Pinchon and I'm from China. I have lived in Estonia for the past three years. Great country. Let me just put it out there. I like it here. That's why I'm still here. And um, I guess the most justified way to um, explain my research is to kind of put it into two parts. One, I want to explain what's the method I used in the research. Another part, I'm going to talk about what I actually want to, um, let's say, discover what kind of a topic, what kind of concept we want to reevaluate evaluate so in academia. Is that okay? Am I talking not loud enough? Can you guys hear me back there? Good. Um, yeah, the, the title itself is kind of misleading because this is not exactly what I'm doing here and it's not my PhD degree. Um, it's a part of that. I am learning how to build a house and the house that I plan to build while being the countryside of Estonia um, but right now, because I'm such a newbie at building, I have like this baby hand, can't do really anything with them. So um, I'm learning. This is a learning process, it will be a part of it, but hopefully this will come into, um, you know, it will, it will get to this moment where I feel more confident about building things myself, and then we can move on with the project. And um, why building Estonia? Um, have a lot to do with the method I choose to use. Um, the research is actually not about building itself. There's a lot of research about vernacular building in Estonia, about how people build for, for, for hundreds, thousands of years over here using log, using timbers, using rocks, all kinds of material. Uh, I'm not a builder myself. I have stayed in university for my entire life. So that's not my specialty and I'm not interested in architecture aspect of the of the discussion about Estonian buildings. What I am interested in is the idea and the conceptualization of creativity. How do people create with their own hand? And how this process of learning kind of um, provide reference and provide inspirations for individual to create. And that's a, that's a concept I try to reevaluate. And, um, Later on in the, in the presentation, I would, I would kind of dip into a little bit about how creativity is, uh, is perceived in design anthropology and in social science researchers in general nowadays. And I would tell you what kind of value I can bring to this whole discourse about creativity through the building practice. Um, that being said, I think it's very self, uh, not self-explanatory, but I think it's kind of described why I want to build in Estonia. It is a methodological concern. Um, there's no way I can directly, I guess some people can do that, but there's no way I can actually wrap my head around what creativity is unless I dive into the experience and actually create something myself. And I think that's a concept I, I, I have been followed for years um, through my anthropological training. Before I come here to Estonia, I was doing a, what do you call it? Bachelor degree in Japan. And that was three years of training of how to read statistic. It was very conventional. It was people um, 
giving you a spreadsheet and, and, and you read through the things and you're trying to understand the data. Individual are not individual. In the social science training I received in Japan, instead individual is this, it's, 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 uh, it's one, it's this number one in a bigger number, let's say a million, two million. And uh, we're trying to gain knowledge about our livelihood. We're trying to gain knowledge about our, our, our living condition, about our individuality, about our individual sociocultural positioning in the society through that number. And uh, how do I put it? It's, it, was a, it wasn't a total waste of my time, but it was sort of a waste of my time. I didn't like the approach. I graduated, but I didn't feel like I have a, a better understanding, a more comprehensive understanding about how people live their life, how people move from places to places. I still feel like it was exactly the moment I entered the college with one question and I came out with the same question unanswered. And that's the moment I found um, anthropology department in Tallinn University and I get to meet all these great teachers I have there, um, Carlo and Maria and Patrick. What I learned from there is phenomenology, especially phenomenological methods. Um, I think there's no consensus regarding what phenomenological method is in anthropology, anthropology um, discipline, the discipline of anthropology, nor in the humanity study in general. But if I may put a definition or my personal understanding on the phenomenological method, I would describe it as living through an experience and trying to describe that experience to a wider audience in order to communicate this knowledge. Very personalized, very individual kind of knowledge. And I, um, I was drawn to it. I was totally sold to the method. I, I liked it. And for my master project, I kind of tried on the project um, of investigating a family, who a Chinese family, immigrant family, who live in Helsinki, um, Finland, right? Yeah, Helsinki, Finland, and running a, a family restaurant over there. It was the first time I get to use this very unique method, um, participant observation, living with them, and, and feeling um, exactly what kind of thing they're going through. Using our body, my sensory organs, as a way to perceive information, instead of sitting in the computer and typing things in and, you know, understand from from something that is so abstract. And I guess that two months provided a more solid understanding of how do I, how can I actually, um, how can I actually intersubjectively understand somebody else's life? Not just in a way of sympathizing them, but actually feeling the way how they feel. There's no sympathy. I don't think there's a power structure within my relationship with my informant while I was doing my master's degree. Instead, I feel this collaborative effort where Z coming to my life and I coming to theirs, and that shared moment was captured and encapsulated in my master's thesis, which I think was the biggest achievement. But I guess two months wasn't enough. It was a master's degree. I got two years to do the whole thing, and uh, I spent two months to do the field work part. And I came back frustrated, I came back not knowing how to go back to my daily routine because there was this moment of detachment of going out of your daily routine and enter somebody else's life. And then you kind of just snatch yourself back into your own daily routine again. And it was a very powerful experience. The only way to experience this is displacement. It's, it's, it's a moment of, um, of not knowing where you are in life anymore because those people have injected their, their energy, their life stories, their, their momentum in life into what you have at the moment. And there's no simple way to kind of just erase all those influences and kind of effect that they have on you. Um, so yeah, 
and I I don't I don't want to, I don't want to go back to reading data. I don't want to go back and uh, and and put people, um, reduce the people, and reduce individual into a number. That's not gonna give me any knowledge. Um, here's the thing: a lot of people will say social sciences, humanities, is about providing value to the world, to the people out there, right? My personal understanding is I cannot provide any value to anybody if I don't act very selfishly. The first thing I need to do when I do a research is I get something out of that. The first thing I need to know from um, from the research experience is how does it make me understand myself better. If I don't even know how to narrate myself, I don't know how to communicate my own experience. There's no way. I can give voice to somebody else. I, I hear this statement very often that people say, "You know what? The reason why I go out to this immigrant family is because they don't have a voice. It's because they are voiceless, and I am this superhero fi- figure who come out of nowhere, drop on your home, and now I'm gonna say, 'Hey, you know what? I'm here to give you your voice, the voice you deserve.'" Well, they do their thing, you know. They 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 can do whatever they feel like. But in my opinion, that is a a bit of an arrogant statement. Uh, I how I approach it is uh, th- this is where I think phenomenology really ca- kind of comes in and provide a solution to the dilemma of how to give people your voice. It's it's not exactly the, the way how we phrase it is give people. It's like we're the giver and they're the one who are helpless. But to think about it. Aren't we supposed to be the one who break this uh, institutional kind of uh, hierarchical structure, and uh, and not put those people into this, let's say, under privileged position in their life? Aren't we the researchers supposed to be the one who are morally justified to come in and provide this equality that everybody craves for? And the only way, in my opinion, to do it. Is applying phenomenological method, that is allowing other people's story to flow through your own story. There is a m- synergy. There is a m- emergence of a new power coming out of this powerful two parties coming to one. That is their story and your story. There is no way you can describe other people's story without letting them flowing through you. And.、Um, And that's what I feel is so powerful about phenomenological methods. How does it relate to my own building experience? I will be building something, and it's not gonna be by my own hand. It looks like yeah, I always claim when I want to brag about how awesome this is gonna be. I always claim it's gonna be using my own hand without heavy machinery, and it's gonna be an individual project. But by the end of the day, you know other people is gonna come in. Nobody is an island. There's no way I can build a house purely by myself. Just to name a few things that I would definitely have to deal with: first, bureaucracy, the paperwork, just to go through the municipality, the vault, to get the permission to even erect the building,、um, to to get the environmental bureau to come over and check the land if I can drill well. To ask people from the electricity company if I can even hook up the electricity for the plot in the future if I do want to, and to work with master carpenters to teach me how to build the roof, unless I want to be, you know, soaking wet every night when it's raining out there. To work with electricians who know how to not electrocute yourself while you're, you know, putting all the wires inside your room. To work with my friends who are gonna come out and help me, hopefully. In the summer, when the weather allows that, to work with my parents, who are gonna be giving me support, moral, financial, whatever,、um, there will be all this connection that got initiated, not because I give somebody voice, but precisely because I created one environment, this artificial, this very complicated and. Articulated kind of environment where individual can flow through my life. They comes in, and they they give me a part of their life story. They shared, 
And hopefully through my mouse, I can share that experience kind of to a, a broader audience inside of academia, outside of academia. And that's how I envision this whole project is gotta go down. Um, I guess it's nothing new. Uh, when people ask me inside the university, what are you doing? I normally use the word autoethnography to describe, excuse me. I always use autoethnography to describe the, the project I'm, I'm going through, but that's really a simple oversimplification of what I'm doing. It's, yeah, there is a, a very negative connotation that is attached to the whole idea of autoethnography. People still are, are suspicious about the academic value of this. You know, like you're writing about your own story. How do you justify the power struggle? How do you justify the, the, the truth? How do you justify the, uh, the moral issue? There's an ethical issue and, and moral. But there, there's a lot of things involved that haven't been properly addressed. And just to avoid those negative connotation, I try not to refer my research as autoethnography. But here I want to explain a little bit more. I think the reason why I don't call it alternate ethnography is not it's because it's not it's not anything new. I'm not only writing about myself. Anthropologists have been um, going out of their own circle, going out of their comfort of inside the ivory hour, uh, ivory tower to to go to a, uh, the indigenous tribe in um, let's say Samoa, right? And and do participant observation of entering somebody's life, learn their language, live with them. Um, maybe marry a local girl, who knows, right? And they have been doing this for years. And they collect valuable data that is going to enable um, a lot of researchers that follows them to kind of work on the ethnographic data that they collected from the site. Those things that they bring back. At the very beginning, 100 years ago, when anthropology was first introduced in, in the Western world, Back then, people were bringing back relics. They were bringing back like uh, antiques, the, the stuff that people use on a day-to-day -day basis, the material aspect of it. And then it kind of changed. Ethnography start to uh, receive and, and gain new life from the life story, right? And now the, the French philosophers like Bourdieu and, uh, and, and then they start to have this um, phenomenological understanding of how life story informs more about indigenous or uh, alienated group than material could tell us and nowadays we want to tell story and here we are am I telling story am I telling a story about um, people who live in the countryside of Estonia am I gonna be able to tell story about my girlfriend am I gonna be able to tell, tell story about anybody else except for myself maybe if I really try but here's the thing I'm lazy I'm extremely lazy. I have limited energy, I have limited resources, and going to somebody else's life requires so much effort. I'm not talking about your intentionality. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about who has got to open their arm and just say, hey, look, you're an anthropologist. This is what I'm looking for. I need anthropology in my life, says nobody. Nobody has got to open their arm and say, hey, look, I want to tell you my story. People pay thousands of bucks to, to go to a psychiatrist to open up, and it takes years of therapies to do that. I simply don't think I can do that. And that's why I feel like my master project was sort of a failure, because people never really told me what, I, uh, what they really think. It was all fake. And by the end of it, they, they even explicitly told me what they, whatever they told me was fake. And I was ending up with all this fake material, and uh, I have to work with those. I'm trying to avoid that, you know, in the in the master uh, in the PhD program. Instead, going to somebody else's life, um, I'm using this new method. Um, I name it autoethnography inspired ethnography, if that makes sense. It's not purely autoethnography, but there are there is this instrumental setting that allows other people to collaborate in an easier kind of environment, in a more friendly and open and more hierarchical free kind of environment. And by that, I mean the building site. I'm creating that. I don't need to enter somebody else's life. Say somebody is running their own restaurant and I have to go in. There's 
great amount of effort I have to put into how to justify my motivation. People are, people are suspicious nowadays, you know? Like, there's not a single dude who just come over and say, hey, you know what? I don't, I don't want anything from you. All I want is to read your mind. That's suspicious as hell. Like, it's just, it, it's uneasy. Somebody come over to my house and say, hey, why don't you let me to live with you for like, let's say a year. How about that? I'll live with you for a year. You don't have to pay me. All I'm asking, all I'm asking is I will write your story. And it's got published and everybody's got to read about it. It's suspicious as hell, to say the least. And it's, it, it, how do I put it? I look different in this country. There's no way I can blend in and say, hey, look, I'm just another Estonian dude. Don't worry about it. I might not, I might not look like you. I'm one of, there's no way I can persuade people to believe that. And this kind of physical characteristic differences really created a big obstacle for me to, to do what I want to do in this country. And for the time being, really, I don't, I don't feel like I want to go uh, to another to another country to do my research. All I am exploring is this magical method that I I think is called author ethnography inspired ethnography. I want to know if it's gonna work or not because not many people have done this. People have written have written a lot about ethnography and people have written a lot about auto ethnography. But combine these two together, I think there's a new way to provide knowledge. I think there's a new way to approach participant observation. Maybe that thing need a a, a total reinvention because it's time has been changing and uh, we don't live in the time of you know those colonial era anymore we need something new and I think this could be something new especially when the mobility of individual has drastically increased in the past decade there's no way we can still find a place and say this is a totally isolated environment and I want to be the only white dude coming here with a, with a camera and record everything and go back to the Western society and put this on the film festival and say, hey, look, I did something great. No, if I go back to China right now, there's no way people are going to give a shit about what I'm doing. There's the only way for me to capture knowledge is to collaborate. And this is what I thought of. Hope it makes sense. Let's move on. Um, on this slide, uh, I put up a few questions that I would like to ask in my research. I will read out the essential question, which is uh, the foundation of uh, all the questions I want to ask. What elements of engagement activate the process of regeneration or generation of knowledge in the context of building practice? It makes a lot of sense when I write that down. You know, a lot of things make sense when they're in a textual form. But when I actually read it out, it's, it's even difficult for me to get what I was trying to say. Basically, let me, let me simplify it. What I'm trying to say is I want to understand where is knowledge coming from? Is it regenerated or is it generated? By that I mean, is knowledge delivered from one individual to another or is it actually, you know, in a magical way, a, a, or is it in a magical way regenerated through a process that we call learning? Is it internally produced or is it actually handed over from one to another one? Is there a middle ground? The regeneration and the generation, is there something in the between? Is it two sides of the spectrum or is it is just this bipolar structure, there's nothing in between? Either you get the knowledge from somebody else or you learn something through your own cognitive uh, consciousness, your process of knowledge. Is there something in between? I, I don't know. And that's a research question I want to ask. And hopefully that question will lead more people to ask about uh, the creativity and the knowledge production within the, pro uh, within the process, the context of building. And then I write down some I've written down some pathway questions which directly kind of address the methodological kind of instrument that I use, kind of correlate with that. First is I asked about what creativity is and um, 
how building practitioner elaborate uh, the creativity concept in the process of embodying existing uh, building techniques through building materials. Basically, how do we engage with material, the, the building material, and how do they gain knowledge from contact using their hand to physically uh, understand the, the practice of building instead of just reading it from textbook. And the second pathway question is how does environment, by that I mean either sociocultural environment or physical environment, inform the process of building? How is this localized? How this building has become vernacular? How does it become traditional? How, why do I look at a building in North America and instantly I know, oh, they're doing all this chinking stuff and they have like lime covers uh, between logs? It's self-explanatory. This is in South. Uh, this is in North America. This is what people have been doing the past two hundred years, and early settlers don't have time to put down logs in the precision way like their Western, uh, like their you know like um, European ancestor have been doing for years. But over here in Estonia, people have ample amount of time. They do log building in the precision way, so there's no need to put the chinking material in between, they just lay down like Legos one over another and if you're skilled enough, there's no way that you have you end up with a you end up with a, a log house with with gaps in between logs. You look at something and visually you already kind of you already kinda of understand how localized it is. And I think that's what I want to understand. How does environment inform this localization process? Oh, finally, pictures. I love pictures. Um, that's me, if you can tell already. And uh, I was holding the a chainsaw for the first time, uh, first time in my life. And if you can tell from the the stance where I was doing this, you know, you're you're never supposed to do this. This is wrong. If you ever pick up a chainsaw, don't do this. The the thing is, this thing wiggles, right? When you're trying to. When, when, when you're trying to add power to the to the motor, this thing wiggles a lot. And if you don't do it right, you, you can lose all kinds of limbs, right? What you want to do is to be positioning the thing right close to your body on the torso side and then kind of use the whole thing. The, the whole momentum need to be there. Look what I was doing. And nobody was asking. Here's the, here's the thing. I went to Mostad. This is a, a NGO that teach people how to do traditional Estonian building in Southern Estonia, in Mostar. Um, and uh, I went to one of their workshop to learn how to build a sauna house. Nobody was asking, yo, have you ever dealt with um, a, a chainsaw before? No, they're just like, hey, here's your chainsaw. Why don't you pick it up? Like I did. You know, like when you're being put into that kind of position, you don't let people know and say, you know, I have never used it. No, like you, you just don't do that. Like I still have some self-respect for myself. I just pick it up very reluctantly, as you can imagine. And I waited until all the other classmates already doing their thing. I said, oh, that's how you started the motor. But I didn't make any noise. I was just like oh, scratching, and there was no learning process. It's not like in the, it was such a culture shock. It's a weird term I'm using. It's not a culture shock. It was such a shock, like even physical, to be there because all the learning I have been getting throughout the years, it's through textbook. It's through somebody telling me like what to do, you know, like because one plus one is two. Remember that. That is your knowledge now. I share that knowledge with you. Keep that in your head. And it's so convenient um, in hindsight because I can keep a lot of stuff in my head without troubling myself. But this is different. I can't keep a chainsaw in my head. I can, I can barely hold it in my hand to start with. And nobody was even there to teach me the proper technique. Even if they did, in hindsight, I wouldn't know how to do it. There's plenty of textbook out there telling you this is a proper way to hold your chainsaw, but the sensation of actually holding it is dramatically different. If you have held a gun before, which I hope you haven't, um, it's not like a Hollywood movie. It's not like you just go down the road and you raise it up and you can shoot people. No, it's like heavy. 
that stuff is metal, and the way how it contacts with your palm, it provides us, it, it produces a sensation that you have never experienced before. And how to kind of understand and 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 internalize that very physical corporal understanding into your knowledge pool is something that is very challenging for me, especially somebody who have never done anything physical um, except for cooking. Yeah, sounds sad, but let's move on. The one over there, uh, the character that is seemingly naked, is actually naked. Um, we call him Naked Dan, uh, his name is Dan. And uh, I met him in a workshop, um, building workshop in Auckland, just early this spring, January. Not spring, uh, winter Estonia. And um, over there it was summer. And he never wore clothes. This dude is just walking around naked. Like, he covered himself with clay. Um, we call it, uh, I think it's just clay, you know, like it's, and he kind of diluted with water and covered it all up. I asked why he does it, and he says like uh, Auckland sun is really is really uh, you know vicious, so he need to protect the skin. I say good thinking, but why don't you just wear some clothes? But you know that's his style, and we we're building all those little doogie looking thing that he was you know forming with his hand are actually gotta be used to build the frame um, around the window frame. This is an earthen building uh, workshop, not a conventional log building. People over there use this cob material, which is a mixture of aggregates, clay, and um, and straws to to kind of you know build up the the whole structure of the building. I was um, I was just finishing up two of my workshop over here, one in Viljandi Culture Academy and another one in Mostar to learn about the log building, and then I wanted something very different. I want to know what does it feel. Uh, to put my hand on some very different, very, very new material that is other than log. And hopefully that could provide new understanding of what log means to me when I'm creating some kind of a structure using the specific material. And it really pan out well. It really pan out well. Uh, if you move your eyes to the, to the next one, that was inside the workshop in Viljandi. Um, actually, Lodi is not far away from Viljandi, and that's where we built it, uh, the first sauna house, the second sauna house in my life. Um, there were six of us, including the master carpenter that was teaching us how to do it. And um, the guy over there was one of our classmates, and um, what he's doing right now, you can see, is to capture a moment that uh, capture the, the kind of the angle from the, the, the lower part of the log, which is supposed to be the first log that lays on the ground when it's finished. Because no matter how much the, the teacher explained to him, look, it's got to stand. Look, it's got to be stable. He's just not convinced. He said, look, there's a curve. How does it stand? I don't believe it. And he was taking picture of that. Uh, later on, this thing did, did stand. You know, it's uh, the ground kind of sunk in, and the thing kind of uh, it embraced the ground very perfectly. But um, in that moment, when somebody trying to persuade you, like this is not gonna work, that is not gonna work, and you're using all this previous um, gained knowledge to understand something that is out there, something that is so unique, something that is so new to you. Um, you get this conflict, you get this moment of frustration. Um, but I think that's something that is really informative. I'm still trying to see, I'm, I'm still trying to understand how does this small clips of moment kind of informs my, my experience of learning log building. I haven't come to a conclusion yet. Um, but it's just, it's just all in all very powerful and, and refreshing if you were in there. This is um, some of the theoretical framework I'm trying to framing my academic endeavor within. I'm very, I'm an avid believer of um, Tim Ingold and his material culture stuff. How he emphasized 
materiality is not supposed to be the trendy thing to do. Understanding things are supposed to be our primary mission instead of understanding the thinginess of things. People abstract things. When you're talking about any scholars nowadays in um, in material culture discipline, they will tell you what they're dealing with is materiality. It's um, it's what makes things things. It's how human individual agency uh, understand things and how this process of understanding work. And I agree with Tim Ingold. What he said, how he explained is Professor Tim Ingold explained the things uh, in one of his essay of uh, that's enough for materiality, where he said things are not supposed to be the slave of individual. Things material out there, the physical world, is not the slave of individual. You can't grant them agency. You can't reason with them. You can't go out and say, hey, look, I want to do this. I want to put this design on you. Therefore, you serve my purpose. It doesn't work that way. Instead, you work with them. You work with the material. And what I mean by that is, um, I, I want to bring out an example. The first thing I went, um, the, the first thing I did when I was in William D, learning about log building wasn't actually about log building. What we did is, is um, building um, an axe handle just to try our hands on how to curb things and using basic hand tools and all that. And um, yeah, I was, I was cocky as hell. I went inside, I was like, are you, are you for real? You're giving me a log of wood that looks already perfect for a handle, and then you're asking me to trace something down on top of it and carve it down and make it a handle. This is simple. This is like elementary stuff. I come here to learn the, the, the real deal, the big boy stuff, right? The log building. And I was really like not happy. I sit there like trying to do this as quick as possible, you know, like trying to impress people. I was, I was really thinking, I'm always thinking, I'm always thinking like, if I did this in 15 minutes or 20 minutes, do I get a cookie, right? Do I get some sort of recognition that I'm, I'm eligible to go for the real deal right now? But um, truth, be, uh, truth be told that I spent two weeks working on that um, axe handle and uh, it wasn't even good. Like I used it for like 15 minutes and there, there are seemingly blisters coming out of my hand just by using that shitty handle. Um, one of the mistakes I made is I was really eager to, to shape this piece of wood into exactly what I traced on top of it. I was very convinced that if the tracing itself, if the mode itself is already considered um, conceptually, aesthetically perfect, there's no need to compromise on the final product. There's no need to consider the material itself. In my head, I'm thinking the human dominance. I was thinking about the willpower, how I can shape anything to the shape I want, as long as I have a proper skill and the proper tool. It, it doesn't work that way. When you're cutting into the grains of the wood, you have to do it in a way that the wood allows you to do so. You can't just, you see there's a curve at the, I, I, can, I can show you. You see there's a curve over here that you want to go in, right? That's how, that's how you imagine in your head. Oh, that is gonna, that is, that, that part is gonna hug my palm so well by the end. But it doesn't allow you to do that. If you take a closer look, oh, well, you probably still can't understand why. But if you were there, you would see that this part is really scruffy. When the tree was growing up, like this part didn't get enough love. It probably didn't get enough sunshine or they didn't get enough nutrients. That part was scruffy. Like just simply using the carving knife to cut into that part, no matter which angle you enter, it's got to leave this scruffy surface. It's got to cut into the grain because it's a knotty, it's a, kind of like a knot. You know, inside the pines and all the trees, you have knots where the things kind of start to grow from that point, right? That's really hard to carve into. And if you insist on that, 
Somebody's got to teach you a lesson. Not somebody. Something's got to teach you a lesson. That thing is a wood. You just, you, you can't work. Here's the thing. It might sound like a cliche. You can't work against the nature. I'm not trying to put individual and nature into two, you know, into a binary kind of a position. But I'm simply telling you, if you're not working with a thing, then they're not going to work with you. There's no hierarchical situation. It's not like human dominating the material and do whatever they feel like. You have to understand them and put yourself right on the side of them. That's the only scenario where things are going to work out to your benefit and ideally for the woods benefit because they maximize their life value, right? Coming back to the, the framework. And um, I, I guess another concept I want to really address in my research is uh, the whole concept of design. How do we design? Like, I don't, I don't know about you, um, but in my head, design has always represented a very specific image. It's a very specific image that an individual, uh, probably wearing a, a very slick, well-made Italian suit, custom-made, sitting in a freaking clean, uh, hospital-like kind of a room, and there's like paper rolled out in front of him, and he's wearing glasses, really slick haircut, and he's drawing stuff on top of it. And by the end of it, uh, he's like, wow, this is amazing. And then he hand over that blueprint to whoever is going to realize and materialize that idea. The design doesn't leave the room where it's produced. That was my very initial and, well, at this point, in hindsight, naive understanding of designing. How do we, how do we actually design things nowadays? I, I, I don't doubt there's still practice like that. People don't go out and they don't really um, interact with the environment. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't interact with the people living in the neighborhood. They, they don't interact with the wood that is growing on the land. Instead, they just have a, a perfect image of a perfect house, a perfect structure in their head. And uh, then they draw data. Then they draw data that they got from other people who have been doing survey on the land. Let's say, the what is the, what is the ground like? How watery is it? How, how much is this building going to sink into the, into the ground when it's built up? Um, this kind of a very matter level data are being collected for the use of the design, but only for the purpose of the design. And once the design is finished, there's little, wig there's little wiggle room as for how much the design can change. But what I want to provide here or in my research is an alternative understanding of that, an alternative approach of designing um, in humanity study, in, in art, that designing is not about imposing your idea. It's not about in, imposing intentionality, your, your concept. It's not about realizing anything. Instead, what I believe is designing is a collective, it's a community-based event. It's a process, it's a flow of things that come together, the individual, the powers, the energy that come to a certain point and it form a congregated entity. And that thing, I will call it a design. It's not a thing, it's not a drawing on the paper. Instead, it's a process. It's something that is so collaborative, it tells a lot about individuals intersubjectivity and how they can understand other people's life and how they can collaborate with the environment. Some more pictures. I talked a little bit about the handle and now if we can go a little bit to the right side. That was the environment which I remembered we were building in, in Mallstaff. It was just early October or November, and it was already snowing. I was really happy. I remember being really happy about seeing snow uh, for the first few days, but then it was just cold. Um, that was my classmate. We were going to the workshop from our accommodation every day on this road, and it takes precisely seven and a half minutes to eight minutes, depends on how slow I walk. And if you can go down there, 
you can see we're working with a lot of rocks over there. Um, again, this one is taken in Auckland workshop where we're building with a lot of natural materials. And those rocks are gonna be used as foundation uh, for uh, an earthen building. They're not commercial grit. They're not in any way regular. Um, they're just from a local sourced kind of, uh, let's say factory, where people have all this leftover thing that no other commercial building company would use. And we kind of collect all those and take them back. It's, it's not designed for, it's not ideal for building a foundation, but if you spend long enough time, it works. Because each rock, you just turn them around. If it doesn't fit in this corner, you kind of lift them up and then put them to the next corner. And um, after a whole week and 20 of us just lifting rocks here and there for an entire week, we're doing this and the foundation was built up. It was, it was like, how do I put it? It was something special. It was something special. I kind of um, injured my little pinky during the process. If anybody is interested, I still have some blood in between the, you know, the nails. You can come and check just to, you know, let you know. On this slide, I want to um, kind of touch upon why am I doing this research, the motivation and what I think would be the value that I can give out to the academic community and the community that is, you know, beyond the academia. On the left side, I list out a, a few questions that have been very commonly asked in social science and, uh, and humanity studies. Um, if you look at the preposition, it's very fixed, right? People in social science, social scientists and uh, and humanity researchers, they're, they're interested in this general topic. I'm also interested in them. Live, learn, create. How do you live? The livelihood of individual, the livelihood of a community, the livelihood of a certain national. Um, that's the age old question that we always ask about, you know, within social science. But how we ask it, it's very different. How a lot of people ask it, it's based on a lot of assumption. Where do you live on? What kind of structure do you live in? Which country have you lived in, right? Those are the questions they ask. And their conclusion coming out of that. There, are they even conclusion? Often there are assumption based on secondhand data that is already out there. Let's say when, you, when you're exploring the, the um, a hy hypothetical question that is called, uh, what is the life like in Estonia countryside? Right? That, is a, that is a question that some people might be interested in asking. What is, a, what is, a life, to, uh, what is life like for somebody who is, uh, who is Chinese or biracial to live in the countryside of Estonia? That is another question. And I'm pretty sure there's people asking those. Well, not specifically that, but in the same kind of a direction, in the same kind of intonation, in the same kind of a tune. And what they would get is it's knowledge that is built upon knowledge. It's, all those words are very heavy. All, all I'm looking at is, is, is preconceptions lumped over each other and we kind of gain knowledge from that. There's word like countryside of Estonia. What is countryside? And what is the concept of being Estonia, being in Estonia? And let's say the example of Chinese immigrant. My, I myself is an immigrant, but by using that word, I'm not an individual anymore. Now I transform into a representative. Now I transform into a, a, a singular representative of a bigger group. And my voice is diminished. What is left over is propaganda. It's a preconceived understanding of, uh, of people already having their head. Oh, this is what a Chinese immigrant is like. That is what it's like in Estonia. I always believe research is about communication. Whoever read my research by the end of the day is initiating a dialogue with me. I'm trying to talk to them. They're trying to talk to me. What I don't want to see my research end up doing is 
they read the title, they read the intro, they already know what I want to talk about. That's the saddest thing ever. People already know, not because they actually know, but because for the fact that everybody have their bias. We grow up in bias. We grow up in, you know, social structures. We grow up in this constitu uh, institutionalized knowledge, and there's no way I can break through that barrier and reach the deepest part of their life and grab something out, preferably a sensory organ, and say, "Hey, this is my research. Read it." There's no way I can do that, right? What I do, what I can do, is not to use those terms, and not to reduce myself, not to inflict self-hate, but instead ask some more detailed, nuanced question, using different preposition. Who do we live with? I do not answer a question with that description. I do not intend to answer any questions. I'm not trying to come to a conclusion by asking questions that is using that kind of a phrase. I'm trying to provide a picture, a thick description of events, and I give you the room to join the core dialogue. I I give you the room to wonder. I give you the room to recreate. This whole thing, uh, once this is finished, you know this presentation is finished. Once my paper is uh, is written up. Once the house is built up. Uh, my job is not done as a researcher. The work I did only assumes its own life, the fullestness, the the fullest of its life, when it reaches the hand of a reader. And I believe at that moment they open it up. They will still wonder. They they don't get answer. I I I pray to God if there is one that my research will never answer any question. Instead, it provide more questions for the people to to ponder. For the people to to answer it for themselves. One example for that phrase to be used is, what kind of environment do you live with? What kind of a tree do you live with on your plot? Or、uh, what kind of neighbor do you live with? What kind of community do you live with? What kind of animal pass through your farm? That's a question I want to ask. They're not phrased exactly like question. They're more like description. But it get people interested. The people who end up reading my research are gonna be like. Huh. I wonder if he's telling the truth. Oh, hopefully not that one.、Um, huh. I wonder what kind of what kind of thing is you know what what that fox look like when he's passing through the passing through his farm. I I wonder what he feels when when he was alone his、uh, in his wooden cabin in the coldest months in、um, in in January when he has nobody around and the electricity is not even hooked up yet and the water is all freezing up and the the pipe in the room has busted because of the cold. Hmm. I wonder how that feels like. That kind of thick description is something I want to provide to my reader, not to directly give them an answer, but again, just to give them an understanding that they can. They can, you know, construct. They can. They can contribute the, themselves. Some more pictures.、Um, very happy, very happy that moment. I was proud. It took me two weeks to finish that thing, and、um, I don't know. That was that was proud because I was I was not yet trying the thing. Five seconds or ten seconds later, when I actually get to try that thing to actually act something down. I will have a very different facial expression. Yeah, I'm not even close to that happy.、Um, but what I really want to、um, communicate here is the whole building process is a process of making mistake.、Um, and I do think、um, mistake are not something that is should be frowned upon. It's not something that should be kind of a, a struggled out, trying to eliminate it. But、uh, I do like the feeling of making a mistake. It's a、uh, It's 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 a struggle, and that struggle is the essence of my day-to-day -day life, and hopefully a lot of other people's daily life. That's elaboration, and that's a manifestation of individuals' livelihood, uh, of their uh, of their、uh, connaissance, their their will to survive. And I think to be able to capture that, you need to be not afraid to make mistakes. And、um, why I think working with master carpenters in countryside of Estonia taught me the most is. 
how they're not verbally communicating my mistake with me before I make the mistake. And that is really something I admire of them. Um, if I already know this axe is gotta be bad and I didn't even get to build this terrible axe, axe handle to begin with, I would never have that sensory feeling, that sensual feeling, that, that feeling of having blister in my hand and the feeling of holding a, a really terribly made handle. And uh, it will be a very different story for me. I can avoid a lot of uh, mistake if somebody simply come over and tell me not to do this, not to do that. Um, but it wouldn't be the same deal. It wouldn't be the same learning process. It wouldn't be so powerful and so ingraining and so country and so intricate that I feel like the memory I gain from making mistake this stays longer. This stays more corporal. The ingrains into my life and the ingrain into my physical form. Um, without making mistake, that would not be a reality. Some random picture because I really don't know what to fit in there anymore. Um, up there it was a log house was being built by the Villain de Culture Academy students one year before me. Um, not a <coughs> excuse me not a structure that was used as a positive example but as a negative one uh, because once you, once you go inside um, from a certain angle of the house you can you can see light from the outside and it's, it's shining and it's, it's beautiful by the way you're not supposed to see uh, lights from the inside of a log house especially when there is no window right um, but still I, I, I liked it I, I would I would not be surprised if there's a bigger hole on my log house if I built one by myself one day and down there I'm you know doing some grinding work not grinding sanding work with a with a sander and to conclude the presentation I want to touch upon how I'm gonna ask um, the previous question that I just talked about about creativity about how we understand the environment, informing our life. Um, I choose three entry, three door that I think would be very informative. First is living on the land. Um, I hope being there just by residing in the countryside would provide a certain understanding of what it's like to be in that specific environment, specific setting. Um, to put it into more concrete terms, I will be getting a plot of land, uh, hopefully close to Tallinn. And um, before I start building things there, I'll be, you know, living there in a yurt or um, a, a, a tent, something that is temporary, just to get a, just get a, a like a more physical understanding of what is a, what is a, what is going on you know around me like is this wood gotta gotta hate me later on in my life just try, trying to trying to see what is a plot like and really get to communicate with the place and get to know what is the neighborhood like the community around me um, before I actually start to envision a house and envisioning the building process of it I'm expecting to do that in the first a few months. Um, and after that, the building will start. And um, yeah, I will be building with my own hand. I will be building with uh, a master carpenter that I already confirmed. I will be building with my friends who are going to come and help. I will be building with strangers who, well, I, I imagine I will put a you know, Facebook notification or something. And people, random people will come and help. Um, in the summer when the time is pleasant and um, yeah what will be the material manifestation of the process of building I mean that's a question that I really want to ask and finally when the building part is done it will become a sharing project I hope I can invite my friends acquaintances people who I know to come over and you know if they feel like living there for a few nights stay with me for a few nights, cooking with me for a few few meals. They'll be well, more than welcome to do so. And we can talk about stuff that is happening in my life, in their life, 
um, this is where I think the majority of the effort I would put into to, to write about the ethnography because this is a, well, so far I can foresee is the most populated kind of a stage where there's a lot of people coming coming through and I'll be providing something and uh, making people just, you know, more comfortable. Not in the in the sense that they feel like it's a comfy cabinet, but it's because I'm I'm sharing something, I'm inviting somebody into my life instead of forcefully insert myself into wait, that sounds bad. Instead of like, you know, just entering somebody's life um, like uh, uh, what an anthropologist would normally do. And this is a stage that I kind of imagine myself uh, encountering a lot of really um, political aspect of the uh, of the of this of the of the social positioning I have I have to deal with in this country. For example, the the how do I deal with government authority when it's time to, um, you know, to to actually. Um, getting a resident permit to, to get a, a living permit if you really want to be living there and how to um, navigate my way through all these bureaucracies and um, and political aspect of the struggle of day-to-day -day life and it will be captured during that stage some more pictures um, this is an interesting picture I would never imagine there will be so much leftover um, in a, a small log building. If you see the log building, it was like it was like I don't know how much is uh, ten square meter. Imagine ten square meter. The log house is ten square meter, right? And we're already using logs that is cut into kind of like the the, the ideal lens for the structure. All we're doing here is to. Um, skin it just basically make it skinless and looks more aesthetic i asked what's the reason to do that and evil told me you know, the master carpenter he told me there's no reason to do it just, we just do it you know and uh we end up with this pile of skin and uh left over and uh, and scrape down stuff from making the notches it was a humongous pile like i i could lie down there and you could imagine two more person lying on top of me, and that's roughly the size of that thing. Um, uh, a very, very intense feeling to see how much things you produce just to just to make something, you know? Um, I don't know what we're doing there. Probably mixing the cob in Auckland. And down there, we're making a very easy uh, office lunch in uh, Villain D Culture Academy. We don't have a place to wash our hands, so it was nasty. Um, my stomach cramps up very, very usual, uh, very, very often while I was there. But yeah, nevertheless, great memories. What I have been doing, I have talked a lot about this uh, in the previous part of the presentation. I did one uh, workshop in Mosta and uh, another building course in Villain the Culture Academy and after that I was kind of trying to detach myself from the log building scene and I went to New Zealand for one and a half months to do this internship in earthen building using the natural materials that you can get from the uh, 15 miles a radius of the of the building site and um, what I will be doing this year is well ideally this is a schedule that I, I envision at the moment from April to, to May and all the way to June, I'll be living on the plot um, in a yurt or in a tent or whatever, uh, as long as I can, you know, keep myself warm, that'll be okay. And the main building process will start from May to October and we'll build the main structure, um, me, one master carpenter and um, all my imagined friend who would come to help, yeah. And after that, from November to January next year, again, I'll be living in uh, living the plot, but this time uh, I'll have ideally have a finished structure where I can live in more comfortably. And I will start to finish the interior work and doing some more decoration. And uh, when the spring comes around next year, hopefully I can cater 
uh, a lot of more of my imagined friend and imagined acquaintances uh, to the places and uh, see how we share this amazing journey together. Um, making notch, me, trying to be cool, um, building up sauna. That whole thing was done in Mostar in five days. So you start off uh, with logs that have been pre-cut into the length and being milled both sides uh, vertical parallel and then we kind of just curved notches and then uh, smoothen the surface, skin it from top and down, uh, put them together, measure stuff, make sure that all things is neatly done. Some of the reference I used um, in the presentation and a quote of myself saying thank you for being here with this presentation. And that's all the thing I have to say about my log building. And um, if you have any question, I'm here with you for the next few minutes or, or so. Thank you. <laughs> That was officially the longest presentation I did. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Nobody left. That's awesome. Well, somebody left to the toilet, but that's all right. Um, yeah. Well, what, what do you think? Somebody's got to come out and, and help me with the building? Uh, I, I would like to talk you would? To you. No, no. Uh, no you wouldn't. I will, oh. but I will be in, if it's in South Estonia. OK. Because I have many works to do also. There. OK, cool. Where is where, where is this gotta be? Yes. Hopefully somewhere um, around Tallinn. Right now I'm, I'm checking the place in Batisa. Oh, you're checking. Yeah. You're just checking the place. Yeah. Because I, I would like to make a suggest you help us with uh, rebuilding all the Soviet Union times house to make some film festival. Are you also building as well? Are you also doing some building project? No, I'm person for film film festival. Okay. So we got some old house, maybe it was a school during the Soviet Union time, so it was not used at all, so now it's very old, and maybe we have to rebuild it or reconstruct it, or we have to search. Where is it at? South Estonia. Okay. So, okay. And I would like to ask you about your friends who will help you. Are they also like foreigners, like foreign students, or they are local? Because it will be maybe... Mm -hmm. I, I uh, think a different the way to, of working, maybe if uh, because I think uh, local people from countryside will build it very fast, maybe uh -huh. because it's very natural. Yeah. Uh, because all these uh, levels of doing of creating, I was uh, observing it from my childhood uh, at my home. Uh -huh. And uh, if they are some foreigners, like students from around probably it would just be my friend I, I don't have many people uh, many friends who are actually from countryside of Estonia and still living countryside of Estonia there's very limited kind of uh, how do I put it opportunities for me to reach out to that demographic yes. right and they will not maybe be able to to do to work in summer because they have their own stuff yeah exactly So I'm feeling like it was just about people who I can get at the moment. Yes, I do imagine there will be a lot of foreigners and people who are who are interested in coming over from a foreign country to specifically help with the project. But um, I do see there is an engagement with the local community, maybe not the stage of the building, but uh, maybe before that, while I was living there, I was thinking about, you know, like going around to, to see, it. you know, like if if there is a possibility for me to initiate some kind of a connect connection with the people in the neighborhood and maybe once this thing is finished there's a possibility i can invite them to come over and uh, you know let's all hang and see how what kind of uh you know connection is gonna come out of that so yes yeah, by the end of the day i'm not forcing any connections um i'm, I'm trying to see this as an event where things naturally happens and uh, with as little facilitation from my part as possible yeah i don't want to be an alienated factor and being a weirdos and then knocking doors down and say hey be my friend you know 
but yeah thank you and uh, I, I would be very interested in, in checking out the project you're doing as well yeah okay. thank you, thank you. <laughs> I just the, the, the idea and the, the project you, you just told us it, I mean physically this uh, to organize it all like mm -hmm. all the working stuff like you know, you, you need to do this and also the knowledge and at the same time in in this project you are also yeah as a human being as an observer mm -hmm. it's like lots of stuff i mean <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's overwhelming like they don't let you graduate if it's a simple project it's phd <laughs> they like they make this extra difficult like when i was thinking about it, i was like how do i how do i like impress people in the in the in the phd doctor seminar yeah this should be good enough for that uh, yeah, you, yeah, you can organize like similar. It, it's similar. got. Also <laughs> it's, ask professor to come. It's gotta be. It's it's difficult to. Um, still, it's difficult to sell this thing as idea, inside of academia because there's still a lot of questions about, like the legitimacy of uh, practice-based research, um, a lot of questions about how, um, I guess in a traditional sense. Uh, people are concerned about the utility of a research, right? How does it benefit? Um, how does it benefit the community? How does it benefit um, the people, basically? And uh, at the moment, I'm addressing some very abstract and a very metaphysical concept like creativity and uh, the utility and uh, the potential value of the research. Still, uh, still a way to be justified, but um, right now i think there uh, there is simply a need for a new method in anthropology there's um very little things that has been done um to kind of reinvent the uh, um participant of the observation um since its inception it was it was pretty much the same right and people have been doing it in very uh, they have been tweaking it uh, from time to time but i think this auto ethnography kind of a turn in anthropology it, it should be welcomed and it, it need more investigation. I'm simply throwing my, my first rock to kind of see what kind of a reaction is gonna come out of it. And um, yeah, I'm, like you said, it's a complicated project. I'm not even... Com but do you have like uh, friends, like really well-known friends for you mm -hmm. who can help you? Like just to organize something like that, yeah. it needs like many eyes. Yeah, just, you know, for to, sure. You know, do you have this group? Because I, I mean, Personally, my husband is like, he really likes the carpenter work and he has done it and he has uh, re, uh, renovated, you know, re renovated, renovated <laughs> old houses. Uh -huh. And so like, and I was thinking, okay, I have to ask him, you know, if he has interest, mm -hmm. you know, definitely I am interested to come to see this process. And if he, you know, has interest, I, I'm going to tell them, then, you know, I, 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 I'm going to write an email yeah, to sure. you and, oh, maybe we can, you know, come. Because it's really, it, the project sounds like so interesting. I know. Like, people say this all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but just like, like uh, I am organizing, organizing organizer here mostly. So I know that the, even like the little stuff to organize it, like... Mm -hmm. It's like a world. I yeah, mean, you, yeah. you have to know precisely, even like the te technique, everything, and then you can observe, and it's like, like it's mixture of uh, thousands. I guess it what well, in um in practicality uh, in terms of practicality. I'm, I'm first like, I guess the best way to answer answer your comment. It's not really a question, right? The the best way to to kind of address your comment is. Um, this whole thing, I, I try to scale it down as, as much as possible. It's not gotta be a huge house. Uh, all I'm imagining is something that is under 20 square meter. You know, it's a small cabin. Uh, first, that is a lot less work workload. And I do have um, this master carpenter that I worked with in Villain Culture Academy, who has got help a, a lot with guiding me and uh, through the process and doing mezzanine, doing all the roofing and, uh, and foundation work. So basically, I will be I will be still an avid learner, an avid apprentice during the whole project. It's not like I would just go out and then start doing this thing and, and die under the, the, the ruins. No, still somebody's gotta guide me, like holding my hands along the way, you know, like like a baby. And um, I like you said, I still see this whole thing as a very chaotic kind of a path that I might be working on, but. 
But yeah, I, things just happen. Also, yeah, right? like things it's just I, 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 I just uh, one of the concepts I try to promote in this research is the randomness or um, the unexpectedness of, of engaging with material. And I think that's how material kind of negotiate their place in human society, in our, in our culture nowadays, right? And I, I welcome those kind of randomness and I welcome changes. I welcome uh, difficulty, all these things. Uh, well, difficulty is a heavy word again. It's like bias, but I I, I want to see more chaotic elements uh, within the research and see how that uh, enriches the the final product, the kind of inform the final ethnography. Yeah, I might not even get to build the whole thing. You know, it's it might get half built up, and then I was like, I don't have money anymore. You know, I simply can't buy another log. What's what I'm gonna do? But it doesn't mean this is a failed project. I still get to talk to those people. All this effort that went into building it, that was a moment that need to be captured, not the final visual representation of the effort. The house itself served nothing unless I get to capture the process of building it. And I think the most valuable part doesn't even leave a trace at all. So no matter how chaotic it is, I'm gonna graduate and people gotta call me doctors. Sure. Thank you. This is the, your project, and you can you do not need to write anything else, to, and you will be graduate. With, with this project, is is that what you mean? You mean is it accompanying with a textual kind of a? You know I mean, a thesis? You need to graduate as a PhD. You have to provide like a monograph, like. Uh, I will still be writing a monograph. Uh -huh. Yeah, that is um, still required. Okay. I mean, yeah. The academia nowadays is not open to this kind of stuff. Okay, I thought that yeah. you get with this project finished. I mean, I, awesome. ideally that would be great because I can just drag all my professors, hey, look, <laughs> <laughs> dissertation right here. Yeah, I mean, some master program they can do something like this, but uh, I, I wonder. I, I hope in two years they get to, you know, I do mean, this kind of you stuff. Pass, like, uh, the proposal of your thesis? Yeah, yeah. So it has so uh, what would the professors re react to your project? They don't know what to say about it because it's so new. And uh, they're just like, hmm, interesting. Let's see what he's going to do with this, you know? Like people are like, have certain expectation to it. And uh, I guess my professor specifically, my supervisor, uh, he see it as, um, as more of a, a exploration to the, to the method of practice-based research. And he want to see what come out of that because that's really a what he see as uh, the direction of the future direction of phenomenology and he want to see more endeavor being put into that direction to, to, to foster this new method of learning with your hand of learning through practice and he's very convinced that this is going to be successful but uh, all the people who are not in the anthropology department which is 80 percent of the professors in the in the board uh, they're just yeah cool interesting let's see if you fail you don't graduate i don't i don't I don't care, no, no, right? Maybe it will be fine. I mean, I really Hopefully. Like, I really like the idea Thank that you. you kind of doing something in public sphere and connect the academia in public. Thank you for the kind word. <laughs> I also think that in, uh, in uh, Tatal University, you would be fine with this project. Uh, <laughs> in Tatal University. I about the, <laughs> the method uh, because uh, I'm also interested in this phenomenological method. And it has been in anthropology around a few decades already, since like uh, 89, I think Jackson wrote his, uh, his ideas on, on how to borrow this idea from philosophy. Sure. And, uh, you know, uh, why is it that we still need to kind of like justify it? And, uh, and, and the other thing is that you, you somehow kind of uh, su su suggested that it is uh, that um, when you um, when you focus on your own experience, then it is somehow like easier. Isn't that kind of like a slippery approach, uh, where do where do you take this phenomenological method and really really go with it? It depends on it why 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 would you say it's slippery? Well, let's address the previous question later. But I want to know why why would you consider this as a slippery? Because you know, I, because it's perhaps it's uh, you know. Where, Perhaps it's because you need to be like super aware of everything that you do mm -hmm. uh, when making yourself uh, or your own experience mm -hmm. as, as the crux of the of the of the research. Mm -hmm. Be and uh, because maybe it's be uh, 
because of the way we are used to uh, we are used to how our science is done you know yeah we, we choose an object and we observe it and we describe it and when we we could conclude something out of it but now you're 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 putting yourself in this in this position as an mm -hmm. object so to speak that's, so that's I'm not sure it, it's it is an object and and then it kind of becomes even uh, more like harder. troublesome yeah it's yeah. troublesome um and to answer that, I guess I'll just use uh, I'll just use um, the the statement or the the answer I used in my in my proposal defense. Uh, I think I am not the object of the research. I do think I'm a part of it, but there's no way to detach myself from any participant observation. Even if I go out and observe somebody else, I need to have a social positioning, and that positioning need to be described in the ethnography. If I'm researching somebody else's life, say there is another character A who has got to be building this, and I'm interested in researching why is he building this here in Estonia and why is he doing this, I still need to have a uh, have a have an angle where I can position myself inside the research because my narrative is got to be there. The whole the final product is got to be a monograph. That's got to be the outcome of of my research and. Uh, and that thing requires a voice, and the voice always comes from a certain angle, a direction. And to describe that direction, I need to have a, a very solid social grounding. And that grounding needs to be explained to the, to the audience. And yeah, I, I think you understand that to, be, to, be any kind of, to do any kind of participant observation, you need to disclose your personal kind of a positionality to the audience, to communicate that knowledge to other people. So there's less ethical concerns, like you're not hiding anything, you're not um, intentionally, um, you know, not disclosing that things need to be to be shared in order for the reader to understand the context, right? You're providing all, uh, uh, the, the, the description that is necessary for them to gain the knowledge that uh, that you think is valuable. Um, right now, what I'm doing is simply, not simply, right now, what I'm doing is to make this my own social person positionality more explicit in a way I position myself probably as an anchor probably as a center of the event but it just it, it's it's so evident of where I stand where this voice come from who I am that there's less doubt in my opinion there's less doubt about uh, let's say um, less, less thing to, for the for the reader to wonder, like w why you're using this voice to narrate the event. I mean, by the end of the day, my story of building this thing is not gonna be the anchor. What I do see is other people's story, how they come over and how they get to share, and how when they're building this thing, um, we can have conversation, and that conversation in a specific setting of. Uh, in the countryside of Estonia, uh, with um, me, this character, an anthropologist, a Chinese guy, uh, uh, a 23-year-old uh, uh, PhD student, whatever that, uh, whatever you might perceive me, I'm there to be a part of the character, a bigger, uh, 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 what is that called? Um, a piece of a bigger picture, right? And I think that helps a lot in clearing out some of the air, clearing out some of the ethical concerns. I might have if I'm just randomly entering somebody's el uh, somebody else's life and trying to tell their story uh, on itself. Because what I notice in my master project is this um, this distance between me and the informant is really tricky, and I can't justify that. You know, like I don't really know when is the moment I should um, not when is the moment. I, I feel like there is forces um, beyond agency that kind of position you into a certain distance with your informant and how to justify that force how to describe that force is even more convoluted and I prefer to have agency kicks in and explain my positionality instead of giving this positionality um, to something that is elusive something that is hard to describe I, I like agency I like to describe intentionality and I think um, this will to do things um, positions me the best and you know ethically least troublesome and I think the first question is about uh, why we need to justify phenomenology methods nowadays right yeah. 
Um, did I did I try to justify it today? I tried a little bit, right? Did you? Yeah, I tried to justify it a little bit. But what I feel is like um, phenomenology in anthropology is widely used. It has been there for for decades. There's no reason for me to come in and say, hey, um, this is uh, the reason why I need to give it, you know, verification. But what I do see is um, there is a responsibility if I'm doing something new methodologically, if I'm trying to combine phenomenology with autoethnography, this new practice-based research, um, it needs to be described in a new way. There's, I, I can't just use somebody else's phenomenological method. Even nowadays, I don't think there is a, um, there's a solid kind of a description or it's widely agreed upon kind of a, a, a idea of what phenomenology is. And I want to give it more of a solid grounding in uh, practice-based research and uh, give it more, you know, kind of a, a, a root, uh, theoretical roots in the, in the practice-based approach. And that's why I feel like it, it can be beneficial if I, I explain it a little bit, yeah. Yeah, sure. And Go ahead, man. How, how, how far do you think that anthropologists like should go in this process of uh, trying to live the thing that you that you want to study, and how far do you can go? And this, I think, also touches upon the ethics mm -hmm. of, uh, apprenticeship, uh, which you didn't uh, talk too much about mm -hmm. the ethical side. Uh, because some people are doing this for, for a living and some yeah. people are studying this for, for many years. Yeah. So how far do you need to go and how, how far you can go? Like when you ask this question, I imagine you already have an answer in your own head. Can you can you share that with me mm -hmm. a little bit? No, what, what do you think? I'm, no, actually, I'm, I'm uh, actually using in my own research the same kind of method, but it's, cool. uh, it's to do with uh, learning music. So. Uh, I'm facing the same kind of uh, issues, so I'm just asking your uh, your uh, ideas and. Uh, what what kind of issue are you facing, if I may ask? I remember you were discussing what is the definition of knowledge. He used knowledge the conception today a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can ask him to answer yeah. what is knowledge. Uh, that's a different kind of. Th I think uh, I'm asking you about like um, perhaps. How far can you go with the method in the sense that uh, um, how 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 deeply you need to go to enter into someone else's life? To yeah, I have a very I have a very tailored answer for my research. But to bring more value to your question, I want to kind of just you know take a peek into what what, what is the specific case you're facing right now. If you can describe it in one or two sentences, maybe I can understand uh, your well, question as I better. Said, I'm, I'm trying to uh, to learn and write about. The uh -huh. So I'm thinking of going to India and uh, also approach it uh, through the apprenticeship method, uh, finding a guru and spend uh, the time with him and and then write about this process. Uh -huh. And so I'm just trying to anticipate some of the issues that might come up and how like uh, you know how much should I you know get involved in the process? When is the time to actually back off? Uh, you know uh, how to re reflect on this process? So, yeah, you know, I, like I don't know how um, how does thing work in Tartu University, right? I mean, we we're we're we're, st we're still lacking uh, an ethic board in Tallinn University. So there's nobody coming over and ask me how do you ethically justify your research, or to make sure that th th this process has got to be ethically justified, right? I don't know if you have th such a system in in place in Tallinn uh, in Tartu no. University. Great, you do whatever you want then. As long no, I, I was say uh, if I'm talking about ethics, I'm talking about your own ethics, really. Yeah, I. Like, uh, this, uh, I lack ethics. If it's uh, if it's acceptable in academia, if I can justify it, if, um, if there's a way I can phrase it as, you know, justifiable, I wouldn't worry myself too much. I would dig, as deep as possible. And uh, the the thing is, I I don't think procedural kind of a consensus is gotta work uh, when you're reflecting during the field work or uh, there's this I, I don't know if you um, are familiar with the concept of, of a procedural um, consensus ba basically it's um, you reflecting during the field work and then as stages progress and then you get 
layered all this layered understanding of how you how you position yourself uh, wh what kind of ethical issue you might face and how deep you want to dig into one certain questions and how do you want to um, derive the question into a new direction it's it's layered up and i don't think it's gotta work what i do encourage myself to do might not work for you is to have an initial plan and um of of a, of a certain boundary let's say that's the end of it no matter what does happen inside of the research i don't care as long as it doesn't reach that boundary that i set for myself for example a very solid example is for my building project um one of the thing i i, I told myself is i don't want to pay anybody right no matter what happened i i don't want to pay the master craftsman i don't want to pay my friends i don't want to pay anybody that's the first thing i set for myself and um, it, it might not look like such an ethical concern to be answered at this point but during the process i find it helpful to not overthink and not to enforce a direction and to let your preconception kick in during the field work and let more of a genuine exper uh, experiment uh, of more of a genuine experience kind of kick in to maximize that experience that's that's what i want to do and by the end of it if there is any other reflection need to be done in hindsight i'll go back and reflect on those before i can actually feel comfortable writing up this experience and always you have the always i think i have the right to kind of you know narrate and the the, the power of narration is so powerful um i just don't see what could be the you know the potential in i don't know what could be the potential of not fulfilling the goal of my research um you know by the end of it it just set boundaries and reflect later enjoy the experience also like referring to is that when we kind of as researchers get, get, get involved so like deeply into this activity or this practice then we kind of like become responsible and because we're people are involved mm -hmm. you know and yeah we, we kind of start to feel like we have something like responsibility that's so, for so sure this, this is where the ethical part comes in that that's for sure again i'm i'm not avoiding this question i know you're like to scrape my mind a little bit but i'm not avoiding it you know like uh all i'm saying is um i have a few things i think can help me avoid my ethical concerns which is if i put the monetary concern aside it's gonna help me relieve a lot of things that might happen during the process i can foresee that just based on my previous experience right and there's a lot of potential for you to to foresee what you can see it's gonna happen once you're you're rooted in the process once you're rooted in the experience because if you're doing a great job in the field work you're gonna be rooted you're gonna have entanglement with a, with a subject of study no doubt about that and at this point if you're anticipating a certain direction or certain responsibility of that entanglement that is only got jeopardized that has got to compromise the the way how you interact with them at the outset and I don't want to do that. I don't know about you, but I don't want to in any way compromise that initial contact. I don't want to go in with that burden of thinking what I might be responsible for you. Um, I want to quote one of my informant. He's just saying, you know, like, I asked him if, if I can use his name in my, you know, final research uh, from the start. I always ask this from the start. And he said, why do you even ask i'm a grown-ass man like i can't handle a real name on your paper and i think a lot of time i might be carried away because we're um so encultured we're so cultured inside of the academia and we um we're more concerned about this than those people and the implication if it wasn't emphasized so much by us it might not be an issue for them and at the final stage, everybody goes through a reflection of ethics. Once you come out of that, I think for me, that will be a perfect moment to understand um, what I did right, what I did wrong. And even if there was an ethical kind of a concern and certain kind of a complication, um, 
again, I don't know. I just have low ethical, you know. I, I'm a man with no boundaries, so it's really hard to to answer your question, bro. Yeah. Why Why is the title of this presentation "Ethics of uh, British"? <coughs> right, you got me there. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I think I think we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again for coming over, and uh, it's great to to be here with you. What a long presentation! I loved it, <laughs> and I hope you had a great evening. And uh, yeah, be well, everyone. Thank I sh you. I should do it. Thank you. I. Really Damn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bless yeah. you a lot.